Commonly known as the Land of Rising Sun, Japan is a culturally rich country. It is located in Asia, the primary language is Japanese, the currency is in yen, and the capital city is Tokyo. Japan has a fascinating and multifaceted culture. On one hand, it is steeped in the deepest of traditions dating back thousands of years. On the other hand, it is a society in a continual state of rapid flux, with continually shifting fads and fashions, and technological development that constantly pushes back the boundaries of what's possible. Religion in Japan is a wonderful mishmash of ideas, from Shintoism and Buddhism. Unlike in the West, religion in Japan is rarely preached, nor is a doctrine. Instead, it is a moral code, a way of living, almost identical to Japanese social norms and values. Japanese religion is also a private family affair. It is separate from the state. There are no religious prayers or symbols in a school graduation ceremony, for example. Religion is rarely discussed in everyday life, and the majority of Japanese do not worship regularly or claim to be religious. However, most people turn to religious rituals in birth, marriage, and death, and take part in spiritual matsuri, or festivals, throughout the year. It is believed that every living thing in nature, such as trees, rocks, flowers, animals, and even sounds, contain kamai, or gods. Consequently, Shinto principles can be seen throughout Japanese culture, where nature and the turning of the seasons are cherished. This is reflected in arts, such as ikebana, flower arranging, and bonsai, Japanese garden design, and the annual celebration of sakura, or cherry blossom. Shinto only got its name when Buddhism came to Japan by the way of China, Tibet, Vietnam, and ultimately Korea. Buddhism arrived in the 6th century, establishing itself in Nara. Over time, Buddhism divided into several sects, the most popular being Zen Buddhism. In essence, Shintoism is the spirituality of this world and this life, whereas Buddhism is concerned with the soul and the afterlife. This explains why for the Japanese, the two religions exist so successfully together without contradiction. To celebrate a birth or marriage, or to pray for a good harvest, the Japanese turn to Shintoism. Funerals, on the other hand, are usually Buddhist ceremonies. Luck, fate, and superstition are important to the Japanese. Many people buy small charms at temples or shrines, which are then attached to handbags, keychains, mobile phones, or hung in cars to bring good luck. Different charms grant different luck, such as exam success or fertility. Prayers are often written on votive tablets, wooden boards called ima that are hung in their hundreds around temple grounds. At famous temples, such as Kayedo's Kimizudera, you'll see votive tablets written in a variety of languages. The most important times of the year in the Japanese calendar are New Year, celebrated from the 1st to the 3rd of January, and Oban, usually held around the 16th of August. At New Year, the Japanese make trips to ancestral graves to pray for late relatives. The first shrine visit of New Year is also important to secure good luck for the year ahead. At Oban, it is believed that the spirits of the ancestors come down to Earth to visit the living. Unlike Halloween, these spirits are welcomed and the Japanese make visits to family graves. Births are celebrated by family visits to shrines. The passing of childhood is commemorated at three key ages, three, five, and seven. And small children are dressed in expensive kimono and are taken to certain shrines, such as Tokyo's Maijai Shrine. Coming of age is officially celebrated at 20. In early January, mass coming of age ceremonies, which are similar to graduations, are held in town halls, followed by shrine visits by young people proudly dressed in bright kimono. One of the most obvious social conventions is the bow. Everyone bows when they say hello, goodbye, thank you, or sorry. Bowing is a term of respect, remorse, gratitude, and greeting. If you meet someone in Japan, you may wish to give them a little bow, but you do not necessarily need to bow to everyone who bows to you. Entering the shop or restaurant, for example, you will be greeted by shouts of welcome and a bow from the staff as a sign of respect to you as the customer. As the customer, you will not be expected to bow back, as you could be facing a long bow off as the staff may feel it necessary to bow back to you. You may prefer to adopt the casual head nod version of the bow as a sign of acknowledgement when thanked for your purchase at the end of your shopping experience. Many Japanese people use the head nod in a more casual, everyday situation. There are several forms of bowing, such as the 43 degree Saikairai bow used for moments of sincere apology or to show the highest of respect, or the 30 degree Kairai bow, which is also used to show respect to superiors. 
Pass. As a visitor to Japan, you will probably never have to use either of these. The Ishaku 15 degree dial is semi-formal and used for greetings when meeting people for the first time. You may have more use for this bow during your first time in Japan or doing business, but you will not be expected to use it and Japanese these days are more familiar with shaking hands. If you are meeting a high-ranking official at a company, the 45 degree bow would be appropriate. Something that confuses many visitors and business people to Japan, but is so easy to understand, is that it is customary to take your shoes off when entering a traditional ryokan, a guest house, a home or temple, or the occasional restaurant. Traditionally, the Japanese took off their shoes when entering homes as people would sleep, sit, and eat on the tatimi mat floors, and footwear worn outside would spread dirt across their living area. Today, people still take off their footwear, partially to keep the inside of a building clean, but also as a sign of respect. Also, nowadays Japanese people rarely wear kimonos in everyday life, reserving them for such occasions as weddings, funerals, tea ceremonies, or other special events, such as summer festivals. As the Japanese culture is one that focuses on respect, the suffix san is often used when you refer to someone else, and it's a term of respect. If referring to someone like Mr. or Mrs. Suzuki, you would say Suzuki-san. However, you would never refer to yourself as san. Japanese cuisine is considered one of the main events for a business meeting or even a trip to Japan. Though Japan is famous for dishes like sushi, rice, noodles, tempura, kobe beef, and teriyaki chicken, there is a plethora of other superb dishes out there for you to try. Fish is an integral part to every meal, and rice is a staple. However, there are still many vegetarian options, such as tofu steak, udon, and more. In Japan, you will hear tons of words for green tea. One of the most common you're likely to hear is matcha, which refers to the finely ground, powdered tea that is used in Japanese tea ceremonies. You can find all kinds of matcha-flavored products in Japan, from a matcha latte at Starbucks, two matcha flavored ice cream, chocolates, and all kinds of sweets. Before eating a meal, the Japanese put their hands together and use the term itadamigasu, which means I humbly receive. After the meal, it's polite to say kochiso sama deshati, which means thank you for the meal. Japanese people will understand if visitors do not have proficient use of chopsticks, but there are some rules you should try to follow. 1. Do not stick your chopsticks into your bowl of rice or pass food around with them. As well as being slightly in couch, these actions have relevance to the Japanese funeral ceremony. 2. It is also advisable not to douse your rice in soy sauce. The Japanese are very proud of their rice, and this seemingly innocent action may surprise and even offend some restaurant owners. And 3. It is not common practice to walk and eat in public, and it's considered bad manners. You may sit down in a public place and eat or stand at restaurants slash shops, but walking and eating is not polite. Also, there is no tipping in Japanese restaurants or other places that many Westerners will expect to tip. The Japanese will always give the best service they can and do their jobs proudly. A waiter or chef would certainly not expect a tip for doing their jobs, and if you tried to leave one, they would awkwardly return your money, so don't tip. Japan's de facto national sport, although this is not an official status, is the fascinating and at times bewildering spectacle that is sumo. Deeply rooted in Japan's culture, sumo has a history of over 1500 years. Legend has it that the very survival of the Japanese people balanced on the outcome of a sumo match between the gods, and indeed sumo originated as a form of shinto ritual. Though it has developed into a professional sport, elements of these rituals are still apparent, from the use of salt to purify the ring, to the shrine-like roof hanging above. Further, the furious, noisy sport of kendo is perhaps Japan's oldest martial art, and blends power, skill, and bravery. Kendo is another popular sport and could be described loosely as Japanese fencing, though the swords are today crafted from four substantial bamboo slats, usually held together by leather straps. Its origins lie in the Kamukura period, from 8, 1185 to 1333, with the samurai who needed to practice their swordsmanship. They established Kenjutsu schools for this purpose, and with the influence of Zen Buddhism, it took on a rather spiritual role as well as physical essence. Over time, the swords were replaced with bamboo staves, and thick, protective body armor was introduced. Today, kendo is practiced all over Japan and is a sport for all ages of participants. Karate and Judo are also widely popular. When thinking of Japan, most of us think of geishas. 
so we think of a geisha as an elegant figure with white makeup, red lips, an elaborate hairstyle, and even more elaborate kimono. This popular image is actually more typical of a Mayoko, or trainee geisha. Fully qualified geisha are more likely to dress in subdued colors and wear natural makeup, relying on skill rather than appearance to entertain their clients. Popular attractions in Japan include the gardens. Most of the gardens in Japan are located in the common peaceful surroundings of monasteries, and some are located in the ruins of castles or feudal lords. They display a very rich look at Japanese art and culture. There are a lot of attractions to see in Japanese gardens, but the mo most worth seeing are the ponds, which are vital parts to every garden. They don't only show Japanese people's subdued integration of spirituality, but also their high level of taste. The castles in Japan were initially built for military purposes, but afterwards they transformed into commercial centers as the time passed and eventually they became popular tourist attractions. They are truly a masterpiece as they were built after careful planning and by the untiring efforts of thousands of labor workers. In addition, there are almost one million shrines in Japan. Most of them serve as a worship home for the followers of Sensuism. These shrines are located in the isolated areas of this country, near to forests, to provide a peaceful and calm feeling to the visitors. When these shrines were first built, they were quite simple, but with the passage of time, they began to look like Buddhist temples due to the influence of Chinese architecture. On the basis of the architecture style of these shrines, they are divided into four types Nagar, Shinmei, Taisha, and Hachiman. Sakura is the Japanese word for cherry blossom, which blooms across Japan between March and May each year. The season is eagerly anticipated during the winter months, and while the blossom is out, crowds of people flock to parks, gardens, and riversides to eat, drink, and be merry underneath the flowers. The Japanese language is believed to be linked to the Altaic language family, which includes Turkish, Mongolian, and other languages but also show similarities to Austronesian languages such as Polynesian. The Japanese writing system consists of three different character sets, kanji, which are several thousand of Chinese characters, and hiragana and katakana, two syllabaries of 46 characters each, together called kana. Japanese text can be written in two ways, in western style, i.e. horizontal rows from the top to the bottom of the page, or in traditional Japanese style, i.e. vertical rows from the right to the left side of the page. Both writing styles exist side by side today. Although Japanese family roles have changed considerably in the 20th century, aspects of the traditional or continuing family still remain. The Japanese have a saying that even if an extended family does not live together, parents and grandparents should live near enough to carry over a bowl of hot soup. Most families in Japan today are nuclear families, such as the ones we have here in Canada. That is to say that a married couple lives together with their children, perhaps with one grandparent, but for the most part, the Japanese family looks much like the traditional Canadian family. If you look at the contemporary Japanese family and the contemporary Canadian or nuclear families, you might assume that the societies are the same and the family plays the same kind of role in both these societies. But if you look historically at Japanese families, you will find that there is a really different kind of social cultural dynamic at work. Moving on to Japan and business, Canada-Japan relations are underpinned by political, economic, and cultural ties, which are bolstered by common values and mutual positive perceptions. Today, Canada and Japan are partners in numerous international groups and organizations, including the G8, G20, APEC, the ASEAN Regional Forum, and the OECD. Both Canada and Japan are strongly committed to ensuring continued economic vitality, cooperative political relations, and development in the Asia-Pacific region. Trade and economic relations between Canada and Japan have been steadily expanding, with a gross domestic product of almost $5.1 trillion as determined in 2014, Japan is the world's third largest national economy and one of Canada's most important economic and commercial partners. Japan is by far Canada's largest bilateral foreign direct investment partner in Asia. Japan's FDI in Canada totaled $17.3 billion in 2013, coming from approximately 330 Japanese subsidiaries and affiliated companies operating in Canada and employing tens of thousands of Canadians. Canadian investment in Japan is also significant and diverse, with over 100 companies active primarily in the automotive, ICT, financial services, and forestry sectors. 
The stock of Canadian direct investment in Japan in 2013 totaled almost $4.7 billion. Japan is Canada's fourth largest merchandise export market and our second largest trading partner in Asia. The Japanese business world can seem just like another world. The framework that governs relationship building, business etiquette, and the entertainment scene differs greatly to what Canadians are accustomed to. There are a myriad of pitfalls into which an unwitting Canadian can fall that will unsettle Japanese counterparts. Whether it is continuous improvement, production, quality or human resource management, Japanese management techniques in many areas lead the world. However, there are other areas where outside observers scratch their head. An example, Japanese companies are notorious for their slow decision making. Canadian business people often talk about their Japanese counterparts stalling or avoiding making a decision. In Japanese business etiquette, Japanese business cards are a must-have. Japanese business people carry at least 100 for a one-week business trip to Japan and expect to give out 3-4 to four Japanese business cards at a small meeting and carry as many as 10-12 to 12 for a larger meeting. They have double-sided Japanese business cards printed with a Japanese language side, being custom designed using the same elements as the English side. If your original business card is not English, such as if it's German, French, or Spanish, then use the double-sided English and Japanese business cards when doing business in Japan. Never flick, throw, slide, lob, or otherwise push your Japanese business card across the table. Always present your Japanese business card, holding it with both hands, Japanese language side facing forward to the most senior member of the Japanese party first, bowing slightly as you do so, and then on down the corporate ladder. Accept a Japanese business card with respect, using both hands saying thank you or ahajime as you do so. Never write notes on a Japanese business card. Carry a small notebook to write down notes or enter them into your PDA. Also, never fidget or play with a Japanese business card and keep your Japanese business cards in a proper carrying case and treat them with respect. Remember to deliberately and carefully pick up all of the Japanese business cards you receive and put them in your case at the end of the meeting. Forgetting a business card is a slap in the face to a business person, even in 2015. It says that you do not consider them to be relevant. On this point, remember that many people in Japan will be with their company for their entire life. Most junior employee you might meet today may control a $50 million budget in 10 years time. Treat him or her with the same respect that you would treat the head person in the company. As for business attire, for men, Japanese business etiquette may be getting less formal, but business attire does not seem to be changing. Wear dark suits, navy or black, with a white shirt and subdued tie from October to April, and a grey suit from May to September. Japanese summers are hot and humid, and most Japanese men wear half sleeve shirts during the summer months. Do not wear a black suit, white shirt, and black tie together, because it's funeral attire. Japanese men typically have well-groomed short hairstyles, but if you are the president of a software, internet designer fashion company, then a ponytail may be acceptable. Japanese companies do not allow male employees to wear beards, nor to shave their heads. Of course your attire is not complete without your Japanese business cards. Women executives, on the other hand, wear shorter or tie back hair, trouser suits or longer skirt suits with seasonal colors. Japanese businesswomen are very fashion conscious, which is evident as the three most popular designers for women business wear are Gucci, Chanel, and Prada. Most Japanese companies do not allow female employees to wear jewelry, very short skirts, or high-heeled shoes. Women, too, are not properly attired without Japanese business cards. As for business meetings, not strictly Japanese business etiquette, but remember to always telephone one to two hours prior to a scheduled meeting to confirm that you are on your way. If you will be late arriving for a meeting, then call at least one hour in advance to allow the customer to reschedule. Also, always arrive 10 minutes early for a meeting, more if the meeting will be with senior executives. If the Japanese side say that the meeting will finish at 4pm, then it probably will not be extended, because employees and facilities often run on tight schedules. Wait to be seated in the meeting room, because there is a custom regarding which party sits on which side of the table, which supposedly dates back to the samurai era. It's good Japanese business etiquette to take lots of notes. It indicates interest, and if you forget a discount that you promised in an early meeting, 
Even a year later, the Japanese side will show you the note they made at the time. If you need a non-disclosure agreement signed, send it well in advance of the meeting. Many companies there do business without written contracts and are wary of foreign company contracts because of horror stories they hear about litigation. If you suddenly slap a non-disclosure agreement on the table at a first meeting, the Japanese side will be embarrassed, probably refuse to sign it until it has been legally reviewed, which can take weeks, and avoid meeting again. As for personal habits, do not blow your nose in a public place, including meeting room. Also, do not grab your host's hand when first meeting, and give it a shake. Many Japanese seldom shake hands and can be uncomfortable doing so, and avoid meeting again. Also, never pat a Japanese man or woman on the back or shoulder, and never make derogatory remarks about anyone, including your competitors and own employees. Always smile, be pleasant, willing to learn, and ask a lot of questions about your customer's company, and none about his or her private life. The Japan External Trade Organization reports that an increasing number of companies around the world are partnering with Japanese companies to develop products and services, create innovative technologies, and create R&D projects. To this day, Japan remains one of the world's leading industrial powers, making doing business in Japan an excellent location for international companies. Some of the key benefits of doing business in Japan are the gateway to the Asian market, a highly educated workforce, discerning consumers and customers, a strong work ethic, and dedicated employees. Overall benefits to doing business internationally include new market opportunities, access to possibly cheaper inputs, increased quality and efficiency, and diversification of your markets and of your brand. Japan has an incredibly rich culture and a growing economy. As it is also a desirable place to do business, having extensive knowledge about the culture and etiquette is vital for success.